we have already seen all these things. So the remaining parts are logging. What is logging? Which is not, it's not log in, <laughs> but it's logging. Um, so logging is the uh, fact that you are able to access the log file. Just correct me if I, I'm not saying right. So you, uh, it's, uh, mm, there are many packages provided within, uh, um, within R to use for logging. And logging is a way to access the log file of the app. For example, in our case, we are talking about the app. Uh, it is used to debug the app code and it is useful, it's a useful feature when debugging someone else's code as well. So the log file is where all the steps taken by the app are registered. It tells you what your app is doing so that being able to access the log file and locate part, the part that is to be debugged uh, is an important task. So to facilitate the location of the part of the shiny code that is to be debugged, a warning should be positioned for simplification of the procedure. So basically, um, as I said, there's several pa uh, R packages uh, which provide you features uh, for uh, logging. Uh, here in this uh, book, uh, particularly in this chapter, we talk about uh, where, am I, where am I package, which is one of them, but it's uh, specialized for um, locating files, in particular when you're using um, a shiny app. So where am I? You can uh, it's on CRAN, so you can install it um, simply as simply as install packages. Uh, and uh, where am I? Uh, function, which is the first fu first function um, that you might think about when you um, when you see this package is let lets you locate uh, the file uh, of the of the app. So it releases the file where you are working on. So you are, imagine if you are debugging an app and you uh, want to know, you get inside the file, you want to know what, what is the name of the file? I don't see and everything. You just do where am I? And it releases, uh, you see this, this was the, uh, the, the, the file I was working on, 15, chapter 15, common application chat. Uh, dot R, mark, R markdown, and he releases this thing. When you uh, obviously, I am in my computer. I have, I have just. I'm not working on a uh, on a server, but in case you're working on a server, you uh, what um, it uh, will release is a list of the files where you can locate the one that you needed. For example, to be um, to give you a, a better idea of what I'm saying is if we see the um, the book. What is it? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, logging. Okay, you might find something like that. Okay, you um, you run your app. And then uh, you see that you have different, uh, th this is a quite important app. So you might have a uh, uh, few things uh, uh, that come up for you to um, locate the things that you need to debug uh, or to check, okay? Um, in particular, uh, he mentioned, uh, where is it, a function um, because uh, when when you uh, maybe the RAS you know but much better than me definitely um, when you debug uh, an app you need to um, th there's few packages in R and one for example is logging or R log or I don't know uh, 
as many, uh, you use uh, the cat function, mm. C-A-T function, um, which is a function that lets you uh, basically um, set up a warning. Okay, so within where am I, um, as the, the classical procedure with the use of base cat function within uh, the login procedure um, uses the cat where function. And uh, this helps you, helps you to producing an output in a user defined function. And it converts the arguments to character vectors, for example, as the same as cat and concatenates them to a single character to, to let you locate the file. Um, so it's just sim much simpler uh, as um, can uh, seems, uh, as you, uh, for example, uh, you can locate this call, where am I, cat where, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can specify, for example, if you want a rule, a bullet, a line or something written, you can specify color, whatever you want. Uh, you locate this call within the app server. Hmm. Okay, we might have a little example and say, um, for example, a feature where can be used. Um, we see this later. Okay, this is this with uh, one more feature within this package is the counter get fun function. So you basically can count the number of times each of the located cut function have been called and plot the statistic of the usage. So you. Um, so the thing is this, uh, you can uh, position this call, cat where, inside each one, um, the book, the calling the author says, this procedure may be a little longer, but it saves you time when you do the backing. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, if you uh, position this cut where call inside each part of the app that is the most uh, called, so the, the part that works more, so it, it recorded most, it is recorded more frequently, you can uh, basically um, then count the number of, of these calls, of these cut where calls, and even make uh, uh, a statistics, a plot, uh, to see how many times each of these uh, calls have been called. <laughs> okay, so you can see, for example, you have, uh, um, I don't know, I can imagine uh, that you have uh, uh, the chance to click a button and this button is clicked a certain number of time, each time, all the time, more than, I don't know, like downloading the final file. Mm -hmm. Okay, that two different things. So one is done more frequently and one is done just at the end of the, the procedure. So you might find that if you position this call in both uh, sections, you can uh, see that the, the first one is called a quite certain number of time and the other one just a few just to yeah, download yeah, yeah. okay so you can use this and and then see imagine that the one that is called uh, the highest number of times would be the one that most probably has to be the bucket mm. because might be the one that causing uh, of a problem or something. Yeah. Okay, so to, to give you um, um, an example, visual example of uh, the, the, this thing is to, for example, we, the, there is a, uh, you can make a plot, how to use it. How, to, how, how can I use, where am I? Okay, for example, and then inside the app. So you can use, where am I inside a plot? And the plot releases 
here the location of the of the file uh, where the plot is made from. Okay, so this this is uh, within. Uh, um, That's spring. crazy. I just, yeah. I'm just surprised that it works. I, it's very impressive, but I, I just can't imagine how it, I, I, I just can't imagine how it, because to me, like, the, I don't know, the source code that's used is, is kind of separated from the files where it's defined at the point that it's um, interpreted by R. Uh, I, I, at least I think. So it sounds it, it's very interesting. I, I can't imagine how it, how, how I, anyway. Yeah, that's cool. So it goes uh, and grab the file, the name of the file. I don't know how to do it, how, how it does. Yeah. yeah? Uh, you make a plot, simple, a simple one, just making uh, with the iris uh, data set. Uh, as usual, several length and several width, and then he with this um, within the the cap, you you can position it in, in, within the title, I think, in the subtitle, or even annotate the, the plot with this, I think. And the spring tip, and where am I? He released the the location of the file. <laughs> okay, so in this context, it is everything we need to know about logging uh, with where am I. More information uh, about general logging, uh, and obviously you can use it within a Shani app as well, uh, that I found it very useful is this blog. Uh, I don't know, I found some information about logging here, Cellroom. Uh, just getting started with logging in R, and there's some, some information, so what is logging and why do we need it? Um, for example, uh, he said that something nice. One, uh, I once spent uh, two hours and a half uh, uh, hours debugging the wrong part of someone else's code. Okay, so and I'd assume a failure. A failure I was seeing um, was in a different part of the code base to where it actually was. And then uh, simply logging of what part of the code was actually running would have uh, prevented that waste of effort. So logging is a way for us to record what's happening with the programs we write. This can be useful for a couple of reasons. And so to, to sort of the code that you run interactively, uh, and then for when uh, your program run unattended, you uh, basically can locate uh, the thing. It sounds hard, because uh, you need to put a message inside of, of the parts that you uh, think that there may be a danger of need for debugging. Okay, so, but uh, then you can locate it easily. No, you, um, it, it maybe it's a bit just on the surface of the thing. But uh, to, this is uh, what the book just mentioned um, a little bit, a little paragraph about these things. Then the, there's a couple of uh, apps uh, which are uh, put in comparison. Where is it? Mm -hmm. To show us uh, what is the difference, um, uh, what, what, what happened in reality uh, sometimes. Um, Okay, so um, this is a, a so logging is a, a, an important part of the optimizing uh, or of optimizing an app. Uh, other problems uh, that may be solved. Uh, and prob are problems that you might encounter when uh, um, an app keeps repeating the same procedure a certain number of times. So you can build an app that what this app does is uh, um, you have two options. 
or just making a call and this app uh, will exactly uh, respond to the command immediately or you can make the UI repeating itself with inside the call but this is uh, the, the option that takes too much for, from the app so the app will work too much and it, that may be cause of a problems uh, like slowing down the app uh, instead of speeding it up so to speed up uh, a little bit, he suggests to um, do not use UI output and render UI, but uh, uh, instead to just put the call and he, the, of, of the action that you require from the app. So an example of this, uh, I hope and this um, twice so we can uh, match them. Uh, where is it? So this is the first uh, version of the app. Okay, and I'll put it here. This is the first version of the app. And then we have the second version of the app. Which is this other one. Okay, two. This is the second one. Hope you, you can see, can, can you see them? Uh, or not? I can see them on your screen. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to work out which one it corresponds okay. to in the book. Okay. The, the, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is the the first one compared to, and this is the second one. Um. Okay. Our, the the first the first app is the more is the one which uses uh is the more complicated one. Okay, so the second one, uh, or, or maybe the, op the opposite, I don't remember. In the first example, the UI will wait for the server to have rendered it, while in the second, we will, we will first see the title. Then he rendered the text after a few seconds. Uh, no, no, no. I made it wrong because <laughs> that was the we have two examples so mm -hmm. I've jumped on the second one sorry about that no, so this is the first and this is the second and the response is the result is the result sorry okay the result is the same but the first version is shorter and easier to understand so this is the first and this is the second. Okay, so the first one is shorter. In this, the first example in the book doesn't mention the two uh, uh, UI output and uh, render UI to do not use. Okay, yeah. they are within the second example. But the first example says, as we have said that the first version is shorter and easier to understand. And I, I, might, I might show you what is the output uh, of these two apps, but basically um, you, one is fast, one is, goes faster and the other a bit less. Yeah. So the difference is that in the first version, I have an action button and then I put, I use JavaScript inside and I add this uh, just one sentence uh, with the toggle. Mm -hmm. Okay. The second one has the same thing, the action button and the plot output. But the ac inside the action button, there is not 
the JavaScript call. Basically, the, uh, the server uh, are uh, exactly the same, besides the fact that the second one has a rack inside, which is, I don't know if you remember, at least what I remember from this function, from the shiny, mastery shiny book was that the function is very useful. Mm -hmm. Instead here, he said that, uh, uh, so it, the function, I don't remember, but he prevents uh, something, so it's useful. And, uh, but uh, here he doesn't use it. As you see, he cut it off. Yeah. Yeah. So this version of the app is faster uh, than this second version because of this thing. Yeah. And he says that, what is it? Okay. So basically change things on the UI based on what happened in the server. Um, can uh, be done uh, three different ways. One is using JavaScript as in the example. So you add JavaScript elements and this would speed up the process. Um, and this is something that happens as well when you substituting the UI output and the render output with more, more direct functions. For example, uh, I don't know, if you request a text use, you use text output instead of uh, UI output and inside request the text. Yeah. Okay, and then the server as well, uh, re uh, use render text instead of render, the, render UI. Yeah. Because if you rend, uh, call the UI output and the render UI, this me uh, means that they re re reload and restart uh, uh, themselves all the time. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. They call as me. Then, uh, so we have a second example. Where is it? Okay. So this is like a kind of. The A, B, and C there, that was like um, the more and more complicated way to solve the problem. So is it just, is it three separate issues that are discussed? Uh, yeah, they are, um, here are three strat strategies to code without uh, um, UI output and render UI. Yeah, One yeah. is implement the UI events with JavaScript, for example, and this is okay. the one that we have just yeah, seen. Yeah. It. No, that's cool. The second one uh, actually uses uh, the substitution of the UI output with. Uh, Right. Okay, should be this one. Yeah. Okay, with this one here. And these apps are pretty, uh, basically made of, uh, uh, you have this uh, UI output mm. and, and while here, you do not call the UI output, but just the text. So you, you especially set a customization for the test, uh, uh, for the text, and then uh, call the, uh, the, the text output. Instead of, you see, there is tag list, and inside, inside, instead of UI output, you call the text output. While in the server, the render UI substituted with render text, even if you have a system slip mm. of three, and again, 
you see in the server what's happened is that when uh, this the server uh, needs the, the, the text called the UI, in this case, which is the UI output. Yeah. yeah. It's funny, is, it, is that the best example, though, that, that could have revealed this? Because like, I, I understand that like you don't want to be passing too much stuff from the server to the user's browser. Uh, because it it will take a long time and because you know uh, and whatnot but also you don't want to have to re-render the whole of the page in the user's browser each time something gets updated which is presumably the the comparison that the ui output versus the text output is trying to reveal but like for, for this though it's it's a it's a static site and it i don't know i mean that's a, 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 sorry i'm using a technical term incorrectly but it that site will only be rendered once both of those two apps so i, I think I, I could understand if there was like if updating the ui was responsive to you know if it reacted to the user clicking on a button or something like that it might reveal the the value of the text output versus the, the ui output you know if there was something that just like prevent pre presented the number of times a button has been clicked and each time the user clicked a button the ui output was performed on the left hand side mm -hmm. and the text output was performed on the right hand side i could see how that would reveal the differences the amount of network traffic the amount of um rendering done on the browser better than an example where it's like the whole app is just built up in one go and i don't know yeah. so so is the is it that on the on the right hand side the the app as a whole will come up come up on the browser immediately but just that the text that's shown in a particular place and in, in the app will come up three seconds later whereas on the left hand side the whole app will take an extra three seconds to exactly yeah right right okay three seconds yeah it's, it's just a little bit later hmm. a little bit but uh, so you can use both. You you don't even notice. Yeah. I don't know if it's the best example. I'm sure that would be many others. You know. Yeah. But uh, you can see there's very little, 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 little difference within the two. But imagine that you have a very complicated app that will save. So that three yeah. seconds will be live. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then what else? Uh, update input. Uh, let's see what I put here. So, update input, same as using uh, select input and update select input. For example, uh, now we see the examples insert UI and remove UI. Uh, a solution will be dynamically change what is in the UI with insert UI and remove UI to make the code simpler for the developer and to make an app which is easier to use uh, from a user perspective. There are some strategies that suggest to avoid some common functions such as, as I said. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in general, what is happening is that we, mm, we change things on the UI based on what happens in the server. And this is done for making R not, do not regenerate the whole UI component, but only changing what is needed. So this is, I don't know what is. Yeah. Maybe, okay. So the examples in this for, for these two, uh, 
for the update input, there is just one app that uh, showing you the, the, the things that he said. So what means update input and to, to use a, an update something, update function that allows you to change the input value from the server side instead of recreating the UI entirely. So an example is this. So you have the select input, the action button, and then update select input. This, uh, so this is a good way to do the thing. So this switch to to update select input makes the code easier to reason about as the select input is where it should be inside the UI. Instead of another pattern where uh, we would use a render UI or UI output, etc. So the third, so the number C insert UI, remove UI is interesting as well because uh, he does uh, an example where he said that you can uh, insert, so have something in the UI and then you just remove it. So it won't basically get involved within the app when, when you don't need it. So to dynamically change what is in the UI, you use remove. So you insert something in the UI and then you remove it. Virtually, obviously, and you don't use it. So uh, we can insert or remove the wall input instead of having uh, the elements inserted but empty. This method allows you to have a smaller DOMI, uh, DOM div, so the specification of the, um, the outcome that are not rendered, uh, are not generated empty. He said that basically this way would be lighter. So you remove uh, the part that you have used and you don't need it anymore. So in, in essence, text, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. In essence, in this third call type, it means that when we send the data to the browser uh, and, and yeah. DOM is, is uh, usually pronounced DOM. It's the document object model. Just think of it as any of our users' browsers, Internet Explorer, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, et cetera. So the document object model is rendering the HTML and, and code that is being received, objects, media, et cetera. By this third option, when the server passes the information, it just doesn't even have the div tag included. So your, your div tag is obviously that uh, uh, container, we'll call it. It's probably the wrong term to use, but it's the object as it is rendered on the screen. So the server just doesn't even include it. It's just missing completely. So by, by using the remove UI or, or include UI, um, it's, it's putting that, uh, it's inserting that div tag of the information that uh, would render the plot uh, or if you refresh it and the option is it's removing it, it's just not even sending it anymore. Um, yeah, that... it's, it's virtually said the removing yeah. it, of course, yeah. Yep. I don't know if you have any experience about those things, any, any experience to share about these things? I, I, I only wanted to bring up the conversation, Russ, of the JavaScript, the... Uh, the uh, details that we had a couple of months ago, uh, the topic on learning JavaScript as a whole. Yeah, In essence, yeah. the underpinning or the, uh, we'll call it the, the shiny server web application 
when you drop into a JavaScript format of being able to manage it, uh, it's it's now at a it's not at foundation yet, but it's it's at a lower level than just the uh, kernel, the R kernel, or or the shiny server uh, piece of it. You're manipulating the document object at a under uh, underpinning. Um, I think about opening the hood of your car, and now you're tweaking yeah, the engine yeah. itself. Okay. Hmm. So, yeah, it is. It's so difficult though, because like, um, the, like have it, you can you can end up with three or four different languages all embedded in the same file, you know? And um, I I I I understand this point about how um, there was one example that was a little bit shorter and a bit easier to reason about, assuming you knew what his javascript on click thing did yeah. um and uh, i i i mean i understand that that the, there is a a kind of value to that I, I'm sorry i don't mean to like <laughs> makes it sound like i really don't want to learn javascript because i do but um yeah i i, I can understand the value of like pushing more of the reactive essence of your app into a javascript uh level but but coming with that is there's a, there's a maintenance issue there's a testing issue that i can see where i i don't think i'd be able to hand over a, an r to an r programmer something where there's a lot of javascript you know within the source code and also I, I, it would require um, to, in order to use a, um, an, a shiny app that use, had a really heavy use of JavaScript within it would probably mean that I couldn't use shiny test or uh, certainly wouldn't be able to use kind of the, the, the kind of server side testing stuff that, that, that you would normally use for are um so you're forced to then use things like um um puppeteer and, and the things that were mentioned earlier on in the the, the book um but yeah i i mean i i understand it's just that like there's often the trade-off that isn't mentioned and i can see that like i'm more worried about the trade-off of like how would i maintain this versus the trade-off of like but it would make for a much better user experience from, from, <laughs> from the user's perspective but yeah I think, uh, yeah it is it is quite interesting I, i'm quite quite enjoying this because certainly those those render ui things uh, i I've, there was one app i was working on a couple of months ago that was just had tons of them and it was quite hard to follow which bit of the app got built yeah. when you know when it's loading up and that um yeah uh anyway um yeah no it's a very interesting chapter this. i don't know the, this this where my function maybe with the the cat uh yeah. where oh, would be a nice feature to use mm. This is what he's just said. Then uh, one more optimization is within the uh, data in memory. So this is a bit complicated for me because, uh, you know, um, let's see what I put here. So nothing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So consider, uh, for for example, deporting the data handling and computation to an external database system, for example, to an SQL database. So in case you, you, you run out of memory, uh, suggestion is to make reference for, to a larger database. Okay, then uh, maybe that there's more about, um, Not very much. 
because it talks about uh, the amount of memory uh, and everything. So, yeah. This is a bit. Uh, so yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll, I can see yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, that makes some sense. There's probably options that don't require you to use a database. So I think there's like um, lazy ways of accessing your data frames, and maybe you could use. I don't know actually. Maybe you could use caching or something in a similar kind of way. But yeah, if if you're having to hold a large data set in memory to on the server side such that yeah and and, and only using say 10 percent five percent of it for any given page that the user is viewing then there may be a better way of doing it but yeah yeah that's cool then the last uh, um uh, we, we have um, this, this, the last bit is reading data. So when uh, you uh, can use use this, uh, use data row, and uh, so use data uh, for reading external data sets or including data sets in your application, you can use file input or for using external databases. This is for reading external databases. Mm. Instead for using, you, you might want to choose uh, between SQL databases or not SQL databases like MongoDB to write operation and store kind of objects. And then he uh, mentioned this package which is an external database. And we see this one here, which is nice. Okay. As you see, this is a database example. You have some, I don't know, things written, uh, whatever, it's an example. <laughs> then, <laughs> okay. Okay, more details. And then you see uh, the analysis of the database, the level of the distribution, the time, uh, and all these things. And this is uh, an example of a database. Um, finally, uh, you need to uh, a sort of checklist and see uh, what uh, what are the choices that you have made, the package data, reading files, external databases, and then uh, if you need to update them or if you did it or not, the size. So th this is something else that would be useful to when you manage large apps and you debug them and everything. Um, these are the parts that I've just kindly jumped. <laughs> um, is uh, when you include data, for example, you can include data inside your application and you, with using this command, as I said, Um, and this is, uh, for example, I didn't, I didn't understand why he mentioned this uh, to dev.r script, because um, if you go here, this is the package, uh, use this. Hmm. And this is the function, use data. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I didn't, which yeah, is those, inside, yeah. Yeah, those dev scripts, mm -hmm. um, they, they contain lots of commands that you might find useful while building an app. And the, so you, you might 
it's just so that you don't have to go searching for what the um function is that you need to do a particular thing while you're developing your particularly if you're using Gollum. Um but yeah. Uh, this this is this is clear. You know, you can use this yeah. function, use data and and the data set if you want to use it. It's okay. And then he he made this. For example, what this is what is done in Tadi Tuesday application. Uh, this application here. Uh, and this is the data set. So you have the data, the data set here that you read it is a, it's a, a web link. And then you use use data and you link this function to big Eva cards, for example, the, the name of the, the thing. And then you can use it for it. Then you can use it within the app. <laughs> we have already seen this app. Okay. Inside as the So I think um, uh, it's almost everything. Uh, there is file input for reading, external data set, different type of files, the allows for different type of files. Uh, and this, this uh, more resources. <laughs> This thing's here. Yeah. Right. Stop sharing and Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, no, it's a, a big list of resources, isn't it? <laughs> that final section. Yeah. Um, no, that's cool. Yeah, uh, sorry, it was a surprisingly long chapter. So sorry it took two weeks mm. to, to, to get through. It's um yeah, but it's a lot to to think about. Certainly, like the the data ingestion, probably um, the many ways to kind of improve. To, but then again, if you think about any app, there's like tons of ways to optimize everything, and you have to kind of balance where you spend your time, don't you? Um, yeah. No, that was really interesting. Uh, Good. Yeah. So um yeah, so next week um uh so I'll I'll try and do the following chapter. Um is it chapter sixteen, the, the next one? Um, um and then I think we'll we'll take a couple of weeks off because of yeah. Christmas and everything. Um uh but then there'll only be um two further chapters which we'll just do in a new year you were quite interested to do the javascript chapter weren't you ryan if i could yeah and, and yeah yeah to complement the presentation of federica and and this optimizing side i so there's there's a bridge or i like to think of it as like a load buffer or or load balancer kind of concept there are caching services. And I think that's where we get into more of chapter 16 as well. But um, Varnish and Redis are two applications that can work towards limiting the amount of server side processing that is required for yeah. rendering a, a, a UI. Um, and I, I, I know these chapters are, are kind of all blending together. Mm. When we talk about databasing as a service, SQL Lite uh, or, or just SQL. And then if we go to a Node.js type concept, that's where you get the read JSON and, and no SQL type frameworks. Um, there are better, more optimal manner of parallel computing. So your web server, the Shiny app, isn't doing all of the data processing. It's just managing 
the data process. So the, the linkage, a lot of the code that Frederico is sharing is bridging into these other applications, right? So I've got my data stored on a completely different application, completely different server, and I'm just pointing at it saying, draw in when the user selects this option kind of concept. Yeah. Um, those balancing or, or caching type services are, are going to make the user experience and the rendering of, okay. of server simpler. Um, I'm interested so, sorry, in the, it was it was, it was Redis and some another tool uh, you mentioned. Varnish. Varnish Varnish is another one. Yep. So these are uh, and I've got uh, I don't think I have now nah, it's an ebook that I've got for it but um, I haven't ever utilized these applications yet so mm. the scale I guess is really the question at hand if you were to deploy it in a enterprise grade application and you've got 10,000 people, you know, per minute linking to your, your web page, you know, uh, processing the web server, you've got to find ways of optimizing the presentation of that media, um, the multi-threading of, of that uh, uh, exchange. So the, the code base or these load balancers that I'm talking about, and that's probably a poor use of word. That's just in my own mind, how I, I, apply it instead of 10,000 people all calling on the same shiny server uh, to uh, process and render data, that's not optimal. So what you do is you cache much of the media so that you're hitting the, the cache server instead of the actual web server itself. Um, that whole framework though is a little bit ephemeral for me. It's mm. still a unicorn I'm trying to I tell you, out. it's a very hard thing to Google for. It's I'm looking huge. at the moment for resources yep. on Shiny and Varnish, and they are not coming up with what no, I was looking no. for at all. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> I, I've, I've only tried to deploy it once, <laughs> an and I could never DIY get it to work. Stuff. Yep, yep, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, but Okay, to the, yeah. to the extent cool. of... I, I'll have a look into that. I don't know anything about either of these tools, but yes. yeah. That's cool. Um, right, I, I I ought to head off, and I'm okay. sure you've got families and everything to go to. Yeah. It was a it was a really good chapter. That I mean, I'm glad you like took us through the whole of it. To be honest, because there was a lot of stuff in there that was really uh, really interesting. Much appreciated. Um, cool. Yes, I'll see you all next week. Then hopefully. Thank you. Bye. Cool. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.